Hello, this is Greg Smalley on Pod 366A Weird Movies Podcast. Joined this week, as I often am, by Giles Edwards. Hello. And by our special guest below us, Eric Kirsten uh, of Academic Film Journal, uh, teacher at the Pratt Institute, and um, also about to launch a new series on weird trees. Weird trees of the world. World War trees. <laughs> Hard to say. <laughs> so we are going to jump right into this week's uh, news, movie news. And uh, I always like to, I always think about having Eric on when we have Jean Roland films to discuss. So we do have some Jean Roland releases later. Uh, first off, I'm going to start off with this item, a uh, yet-to-be-released movie, yet-to-be-premiered movie. Giles, uh, I didn't want to have you do this too much this week because of time, but I think it would be worthwhile to describe this still we're looking at. Sure, sure. This one, it, it's the picture of a, of a young brunette with uh, much of her hair dyed, uh, either bleached or dyed quite blonde, somber expression prominent eyebrows, wonderful uh, eyelash work going on. But the main diversion here is uh, this young woman's face is kind of splitting in half uh, right at the uh, bilateral line with the nose, exposing beneath, among other things, a third eye. Uh, what looks like golden, uh, maybe uh, olive sprigs, a couple five petal flower things, also a gold or brassy tone thing, but otherwise embedded in what one might imagine uh, inner face flesh would appear to be. The image reminds me like looking at a pomegranate that's been split over. Yes, yes, yeah. definitely some some pomegranate overtones there, which I imagine might very well tie into what this is a, a promotional still for. Yes, it's called, I'm going to just say, go, get in, right into it, called she loves blossom blossoms she loved blossoms more and i'll just read the log line three brothers build an unusual time machine in order to bring their long dead mother back to life when their delusion or delusional father comes into the picture the experiments go awry and they descend into a psychedelic hellscape where the past and present fuse in comedic yet deeply disturbing exploration of grief which sounds good to us. Um, what really caught my interest and elevated this into something I thought we should discuss is that it's already been taken up by Yellow Veil Pictures. Oh, yeah, generally uh, do stuff that we are interested in. So, I'm also in, yeah. from the script. Yeah. Like they didn't wait till it to start shooting and they like the script. Oh. From what I read. Nice. Right. Yes. That's the article on just have one small article on it. And that's what they said. Yeah. So, Looks um, like it could be really good or really pretentious or one of those. Both. Huh? It could be both. I've yeah, seen really good pretentious both. movies. Could be both. You know, those movies where it like it looks like it's going to be really psychedelic and weird, but then all the psychedelic movements are just in like a dream. And then everything yeah. else is like family. Yeah, you got a hundred minutes uh, melodrama <laughs> and that ninety-second dream thing right. stuck somewhere in the third act. But but if it can do the me or everything everywhere all at once kind of thing and just go way out there, you know, everything everywhere all at once has proved there's a market for that. Based on this, still, I'm going to say that uh, they they are promoting it as a surreal uh film and often that gets thrown around loosely but these guys based on this image these guys look like they are serious mm -hmm. about it to me so right yeah. we shall see we shall see speaking of we shall see there's another one um that i think may meet eric's description better yeah, we don't know for it. sure all we see here in this uh uh still is it looks like a black and white um just drawing chalk drawing perhaps with some sort of figure encased in a shower of light and a shadow bending behind him and this is an image for altered perceptions is the name of this mm -hmm. um i saw the coming attractions 
<laughs> but I couldn't finish it because it was just so slow. The it three minute seemed, trailer. <laughs> yeah, it seemed kind of like a a yuppie Terminator kind of thing where it's just walking and talking, and I'm just like, get to the point. It's the trailer. Oh, there's not just walking and talking. There was also a lot of podium lecturing too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Who so, knows? That could be good. I'll I'll read the log line for this one. In a post pandemic world, things are slowly returning to some sense of normalcy. People are beginning to breathe, breathe a sigh of relief world peace on the horizon. Don't know where that came from. That is until things begin to take a strange turn and something more menacing and frightening begins to happen. Something so deadly and bizarre that modern science cannot explain it. Um, what, from what I can gather from this, um, there is a lot thrown in here. It's, it's supposed to be an LGBTQ thing, although you can't get any of that from the trailer. Um, it's got a pandemic that causes men only to hallucinate, and there is a government conspiracy uh, in it, too. And um, I, it just kind of popped up. I think this one may be one of those low-budget films that uses the dream sequence thing that Eric was talking about before yeah. in an otherwise normal... A lot of male, male objectification. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's rare enough, certainly. <laughs> it's been very heavily astroturfed on IMDb with that. So it says there's like 50 critics reviews and they're all interviews with the director or oh. it notices that it's Oscar eligible in about <laughs> 20 different categories. Hey. It's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the one review I did read uh, compared it to Neil Breen, which seems more uh, interesting perhaps uh, well that's suggested that's something yeah, certainly exactly that's something <laughs> unless they're trying to do it intentionally which i don't think they are no I, yeah looking looking at the uh filmmaking history i think they have their own vision that they are pursuing so yeah yeah i do not have a lot of hope for this one but it does seem like it's it's oddball at the very least it and it great. is a movie that will be on Tubi, I believe, so you'll be able to check it out for free and see if, uh, it lives down to the trailer or exceeds it. Um, but let's move to physical media, which is where oh. we really shine. Um, and the first one up is Yikes. this. This is Goodbye Uncle Tom, and I think this it's a 4K Ultra HD release and a four, four discs. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think is a UK HD disc, probably a Blu-ray with the film, a Blu-ray of extra features, and the CD soundtrack. Oh my god! Um, well, the soundtrack's great. The soundtrack yeah. is good. Yeah, this is. Uh, I and I yeah, if it drops more just for the soundtrack alone, that would be because that's probably the only yeah. place you're really going to get your hands on that remotely legally. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I I own the soundtrack. Um, yes. Yeah. I, it's I think bitching. I just got it digitally. Uh, okay, yes, okay. I thought, yeah, I thought you went to an obscure auction and somehow ended up with that. Was uh, what I remember you. Um, Maybe it's uh, so. It is sort of. Um, we, we're off on the soundtrack, uh, but um, <laughs> <Safely>. <laughs> that that I just love that entire period of uh, the late '60s, early '70s Italian composers who were all trying to to top uh Ennio Morricone yeah there's it's kind of the last gasp of kind of jazz based soundtrack pop music uh before everything got taken over by rock and right. um, and the whole antithetical thing where if it's really violent it's soft yeah. balladry and stuff they never do that anymore or or if it's really violent it's weird and up tempo the the uncle tom theme is yeah, just yeah, exactly. a bizarre well, combination of unsettling and real just march worthy right i love that and these horrible movies will have fantastic from the period will have fan, italian movies will have mm -hmm. fantastic soundtracks like uh black emmanuel a you know almost porno uh soft <laughs> movie just has this wonderful soundtrack to it i'll have to check that out um but anyway uh but as for the movie i believe this is the first time it's been released separately on blu-ray i think they collected a bunch of special features that had been spread around a bunch of different releases it was in a three disc release with some other jacob petty and prosperity movies and 
I, I believe this is the first time it's been released alone, although I also believe none of the special features are unique to this release. I could be incorrect on that. There could be a new uh, interview or two, uh, but it contains both cuts of the film, the original uh, controversial race baiting uh, version, and then one that took out the race baiting material and replaced it instead with an interracial rape scene. So, right. Oh, that's, that's classic. Um, child child uh, sex, sexuality. Well, I think those were... Oh, okay, cause so so that was only in the one? Okay, cool. All right. I just yeah. saw a big thing about Prosperi, or Jacopetti, sorry, and his proclivities, and then started watching some of this again in that light, and I was like, ah, okay. I, whoa, I hadn't heard that. Oh yeah, is that new information or? Uh... I don't know. I saw it on YouTube while sort of looking at things to prepare for this, because you know I started to watch it because I love the songs and everything, mm -hmm. and I watched like as much of a segment as I could. The end is great though, when it has like Nat Turner killing yeah. lots of white people. I'm like, oh, finally. That was but the like... part that made uh, Pauline Kale uh, give it a negative review. <laughs> but the it rest, was I mean, to race war. I stress it's more just like knowing that these people in this were, were there because that or die at the hands of Papa Doc's gunmen, mm. basically, that they were slaves portraying slaves. So for anybody who doesn't know, we haven't even explained what, <laughs> what this is. is. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's made by the shockumentarians from Mondo Cane. They made a, it's a fake documentary about time traveling Italians who go back to the days of American slavery uh, to uh, document all the atrocities and horrors and mm -hmm. mostly a lot of nudity and gore. And it is very, and it uses, it uses a lot of actual uh, um, texts from abolitionists and things and historical texts. So it's this mm -hmm. very weird mix of actual scholarship and just balls out exploitation. Mm -hmm. With, yeah, that's yeah, that's the fastest way I could describe it. The largest cast of nude people they were they were as Eric uh, mentioned they were Haitians uh, cast in this so um, and there are just acres and acres of nude flesh as the slaves are hoarded from herded yeah. from place to place. Herded, it's something to see. I mean, it's not it fine for sure. I don't know if you guys have seen Mandingo. But I watched it and was so traumatized after that movie that it took me years to get over it. And I really didn't get over it until uh, Django Unchained came out. And it was sort of like all my anguish from that movie was finally at an outlet because that movie leaves you hanging. You know what I mean? There is no comeuppance in that. Yeah. It's just brutalities. And it's all done so cheerily with James Mason and everything. And just like, good God, which makes me kind of wary of this one. Oh, it's like you go uh you go deep into this stuff it is it's no longer fun <laughs> fun is not how i would describe goodbye uncle tom at all yeah. right exactly well you know like exploitation sizzling whatever you can get some of that in mondo Cane and things but <laughs> i think this is a bit this is the most extreme. I mean, they don't have like the animal, actual animal deaths or the actual deaths that were in Africa, Adio, but it is right. very, uh, for fictionalized stuff, it's very, very extreme. And there, there is a troubling scene. Um, and you're mentioning one of the guys had a, maybe a, a problem with pedophilia. Yeah. He there is a jail. troubling, very troubling pedophilia type scene in this, yeah. this film, uh, where a slave speaks, tries to, a underage slave tries to seduce the cameraman. <laughs> that So that knowledge really uh, has that scene that was already very disturbing, makes it more disturbing now. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to something yes. less disturbing, perhaps. Oh, there you go. oh no, also something boring. Not, good, good. Uh, not nice necessarily for everyone, but uh, this is, we've talked about this many times, Giles and I have, so um, I'm going to let Eric say if he has any thoughts, but it is 
nostalgia finally, Andrei Tarkovsky's nostalgia finally out on 4K Ultra HD. The restored version had toured for a while, and we talked about it in that context in previous episodes. But so, uh, since we have talked about it before, if Eric, if you want to say anything about Ab nostalgia. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm excited for this because, as I'm sure you know, the circulating discs and prints are just kind of like very video mastery and it's just and i'm just like well is that how russians shot everything because they didn't have any money for good film or the film got lost and held up in some kind of censorship bureau or something and so knowing that there's a 4k coming i'm very sort of excited about being able to see these images and kind of the beauty they deserve and it is a very very slow movie but you know the whole idea of the slowness is to sort of attune you and chill you out you know like that whole scene of him walking back and forth across the empty pond with the uh flame it, it's just like by the end you're so into it if you commit to it that it's like this it is a kind of a spiritual experience you know and i love his use of you see a lot of this in stalker too of sort of blurring the, the difference between the inside and outside of buildings so that like art becomes the outside i mean it's just very complicated where it looks it's halfway through being like a rotting condemned house yeah. and halfway to being land art and halfway to being like a dream nightmare kind of scenario and there's just no one right interpretation the more you stare the more it kind of blends into something else but and but that's, I, oh go ahead but, oh and i was gonna say but you know the whole thing with the guy who locks his family up and doesn't let him out. I mean, I'm sure it makes a nice uh, metaphor for Stalinism, mm. but it's very depressing <laughs> that he gets so hung up on that. And that's like, there's a million other things with the Italian art world you could do, but that that's it. None of them quite so dreary though. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like he stops all case. the other stuff so he can hang out with this guy, like all the things that guide wants to show him. So we did jump into discussing it without, if you haven't seen it, simply the plot is it's a Russian in Italy researching a composer and he's missing, missing Mother Rush, Russia. Right. Uh, that was sort of uh, Tarkovsky's situation at the time. So it's, it's autobiographical. And he never came, never went back to Russia after this. He sort of was a um, unwilling defector. He was not allowed back. Um, and he very much missed missed Russia, although he did not miss communism at all. Mm, yeah. And so that's nostalgia. And now we're going to get into Jean Roland. First up is the nude vampire. And um, this, I have to say, that this cover that they've chosen, Indicator has chosen for their Blu-ray release of this one, is one of my favorite movies. It's got to be one of my favorite movie posters and certainly my favorite Jean Roland. A lot of them were done in this style. I don't know if I could even describe it. Uh, Giles, if you can keep it to, you know, like under a minute, if you can uh. describe kind of what's going on here a little. Okay, so we have a sort of high fantasy motif overall with a flourish of, I'm going to describe as late 60s, early 70s, Eastern European animation uh, figure techniques. We have a uh, candelabra toting uh, red haired, flaming red haired, topless esque, but long, swooping, uh, flowing death purple garb. I'm going to guess she's a vampiress in the center there. She's below some very Beelzebub looking uh, skull and antler thing. And she and the whole thing, she is surrounded by this circle with skulls and sort of spikes and with a center kind of yellow sun thing, uh, which uh, makes her that much more prominent. And this entire what's it is flanked on many sides by various macabre and eldritch images, a long fingernail, a topless woman with swirls of... Uh, Mm, coil a uh, painted coils around her breast on the one side and on the other side a pair of possibly twins looking sinisterly at the center figure and above there's a 
there's an architectural scape with a procession of individuals on the left hand side with what looks like a red moon and on the other side is another red moon with some bats and another uh, eldritch looking sort of person vampiric person looking down on a topless probably victim and of course by her ankles are a handful of dark blue to black demons yeah and those scenes may or may not appear in the movie <laughs> um, hey, it's a great poster though that's for sure it's a great poster uh, it's that, like a mandala. Decadent, the, decadent art, yeah. art nouveau kind of thing. I mean, it's like the 60s psychedelic poster look. Everything's in that. And it is, the plot of this one is really impossible to describe. I think it's Roland's craziest plot. But in the end, it's about a vampire who's not very often nude, really, which is sort right. of misleading. <laughs> There's not as much sex in this as there are in the other Roland movies. It was his second movie as probably not quite as accomplished uh, as the other ones, but I kind of love it because the plot is so crazy. There's this interdimensional conspiracy that's going on and some demon figures and the Castell twins show up for the first time. But um, I'm going to let Eric talk about it since I consider him our Roland expert. Oh, well, thanks. Well, um, I don't know. It's not my favorite one, because like you said, it's not his most accomplished. It's his first like color movie and... I don't know, the colors seem a little weird off. I'm hoping this 4K restoration will really kind of bring them back into some kind of color. You know, he really sort of depends a lot on his collaborators. And I think like the collaborators kind of let him down in spots, especially the costume designer. I mean, some of those costumes, it's just like, just let him wear anything. It's better than this kind of thing just designed to be outrageous that nobody would ever wear in a million years. Whereas in other films, it's like very clever and innovative and cute. And the music's, the music is hit or miss. And uh, I don't know. That's just kind of my issues with it. And the plot, like you said, is kind of so needlessly ridiculous that it seems like he didn't know where it was going when he started writing it. And how it was just getting out some strange issues. Hmm. But, um, you know, it's as part of that as part of his philosophy and his film oeuvre, if you will, and sort of, you know, linking it all to his great mentor, Bataille, it's uh, it's kind of perfect. And then, you know, after that comes Shiver of the Vampires. I think that's his third one. I think so, yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, everything sort of clicks in that movie. It's got edgy direction, good setting, good costumes, that great music sort of driving everything along. And it sort of takes those psychedelic 60s tropes and finds a use for them other than just this kind of uh, surface sort of pop pop art nodding that this movie seems to do. But hey, it's still Roland. It'll still put you to sleep and half awake sort of miasma mm -hmm. that's just perfect for Roland. And and if nothing else, it brought us this movie poster. So yes, uh, <laughs> the poster sensational. Yes. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next one that Indicator is releasing, and they're they're indicate releasing these Jean Roland ones kind of haphazardly. They they don't seem to be in any kind of chronological or thematic order. Because um, this one is from later, it's from 1974. Actually, that's not as much later as I thought. I thought it was probably more like 78. Um, cover is very simple. It's just a woman uh, who yeah. is nearly topless. Uh, it's not the elaborate artwork of the previous one. This is The Demoniacs, which is not a vampire movie. This is a movie kind of a uh, much different, uh, a very unique premise for a horror movie or setting for a horror movie, and that's among wreckers who are sort of people who deliberately wreck ships and then loot them, uh, and that's 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 the premise. And then there's a uh, woman becomes a ghost and gets vengeance on them. Basically, two women. Okay, two women. Uh, there's a clown. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a mysterious clown, a ruined yeah, castle, the... magical powers, revenge. Yeah, this I sounds think. good. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on this one, Eric? Well, my I have a problem with movies that are like rape, rapey, revengey, where it's all rape and barely any revenge. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? 
it seems unbalanced. Like in here, it's like they're raped repeatedly by these evil pirates. They get to come back if they sell their souls for vengeance, not to give away the plot. And what's their vengeance plan? I'm just going to let them rape me a dozen more times and then they'll get sleepy and I'll trap them in the surf. It's like, Jesus, you know, huh. first let them kill me again. It's like, dude, rip them apart, drink his blood, <laughs> crucify him. Spit on their grave, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Anything. You know, I mean, so most of the story is basically told from the pirate's point of view. So you got this kind of reprehensible lead lead male raper guy who gets all the good lines and parts and the complicated character development. It just seems like it's also it's sort of catering to the distributors and producers, you know, raincoat and market. Mm. You know, in the beginning, like as you know, I don't know if you've seen that documentary, but they talk about how pornography and early when it first came out in France in the 60s, it was rebellion, it was kind of chic, it was kind of hit, but that can only last so long, and eventually it gets kind of tawdry, you know, wherever you go. You know, they keep talking in like the anti-porn crusaders talk about like they're afraid of this kind of thing where eventually normal pornography is so blasé that you need like rape and violence to get aroused where once like a an ankle would get you aroused or whatever it's just this slow steady uh need to up the sensation sensationalism and it's like movies like this and some of the other ones that came out sort of make me think that's true but if you're going to have like an exploitation cathartic revenge i'm all about cathartic catharsis with these kind of movies if you leave me hanging after all that stuff, I'm mad. You know what I mean? I got no place for that outlet. <sighs> so that's my think on that. But it's still really, really beautiful in spots and dreamy. That's pro it probably reflects, you know, commercial realities for, yeah. for what because he, he had to um <laughs> now this isn't porn, it's it's a sexy no. horror movie, right. but um, you know, he had to do porn to pay the bills. Yeah. And I I don't think I've ever seen any of his porn films. Um, Me neither. But uh, well, maybe Indicator will uh, continue <laughs> mining his catalog. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think he had to do like two of these to do one of his own kind of thing. Yeah. Like Mario Bava had to do that too, in a way, with a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, if it gave us fascination or uh was it night of the hunted i think it's called i like both of those a lot I like night, of, night of the hunted is one that doesn't get mentioned a lot and i yeah. i just like that one that that one has the um sort of the premise that the the their their mental patients and they only have like a one minute memory or one or two minute memory they have very right. short term memory which is um a very uh elaborate plot for a Roland film because uh, it allows some dreaminess, but uh, usually they're not known for their extensive plotting. Um, right. So yeah, work. that's Demoniac. So Eric's <clears throat> not a huge fan of either of these Roland pieces. <laughs> I like the nude vampire, not much of a fan of the Demoniacs. Um, right. But I do like the nude vampire. I like it precisely because the plot is so wacky <laughs> wacky yeah well i am excited to see it in 4k that can always you never know how that can change of the good of the yes because as always his uh, visuals are very intense yeah. uh now speaking of a movie that i should it's one that i really should have seen and haven't um i am Q okay greg i haven't seen it either oh well <laughs> <laughs> i am cute but this I would have thought has been in the Criterion Collection forever since when it started, and I would be wrong because this is apparently its first Criterion Collection release. Um, it is a sort of experimental documentary about Cuba made by Cubans and Russians together. Eric, have you seen this? I've seen chunks of it, you know oh. what I mean? And it's funny, it makes a good double bill with uh, Uncle Tom because there's a huge sort of not a child pornography but just a sort of street walkers seducing um the american male tourists in the pre-castro cuba and just sort of this this trade of sort of sexual predation but not in a sort of a violent way just in sort of a you know i'm here for a, 
a vacation with the boys. I'm writing it off on my taxes or my, uh, my, we're supposed to have a business meeting later and that's why we're here, but we're really here to drink and gamble and all these other things that are illegal and hard to do in America. But, you know, there's a great poetic kind of realism floating through it all. Very imaginative, very great use of symbolism and everything else. It's alive, it's vibrant. It's full of resonant, resonance and deep images. Like, you know, art doesn't really matter or cut through anything if it's not connected to something. You know what I mean? And everything in I Am Cuba is art that's connected to something. And it all works, works really, really well. It's classic. Yeah. What I have heard about it is uh, uh, everybody praises the camera work, and there are apparently some very advanced yeah. camera movements from 1964 that make people think, uh, well, how did they do that? Right. That's probably a CIA PSYOP. It's almost Wellsian in spots. Ah. And the other thing I've heard is that, like, the first segment, I believe, is kind of... Um, surreal and then it gets into more uh normal realism um right. i could be wrong on that it has been tagged with surrealism uh forever and i believe yeah. that parts of it are surreal and other parts are not yeah i mean it's poetic realism whatever that means it's a perfect example sort of like um black orpheus or any of those others where it's sort of both simultaneously, uh, you know, neorealist, let's say, and and out there surrealism, but they're kind of tied together, hmm. either pretentiously or very well. And this was very well. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, give it a shot. I, I, yes, I will. If I probably in the next Criterion sale, I'll probably end up picking this one up. I do think because it is a big hole in my. Uh, film knowledge everybody has holes so i'm not ashamed of it but oh, yeah. <laughs> all right it's never too late so the final um, item this is simply a uh, the cover is simply a man sort of raging at the sky <laughs> it's um, an odd choice yes <laughs> lars von trier's network i mean <laughs> yeah why why this image i don't it's like um, on, there's a million weird images yeah there. i've seen certainly the first uh of the three and yeah i can think of and that was 10 or more years ago and i can think of about half a dozen things that would make yeah. um, more sense than this but we we haven't said the name yet though, oh so it's, it's oh, lars von trier's the kingdom trilogy which are a series of three tv sorry i guess miniseries that he did uh Right. Three, uh, one in 94 like 94 97 and then he just recently uh, did a third one and it is about as far as i know i haven't seen it it's about a um haunted hospital let's say yep it's often described as Lord, lars von trier's version of twin peaks so take That's it so away people who've seen it and also if you've seen the movie the hospital i don't know if you have patty chayefsky speaking of network but it's sort of a mix of that kind of thing, along with the, uh, like you said, like the Twin Peaks, the Lynchian sort of thing, reminding you know, you know, like Lars. I don't know if you've seen uh, what's it called, Europa, or sometimes Zentropa, by La which is definitely my favorite of his movies because it's the most sort of weird and it's in black and white with some color and it's got lots of trains. If you're into trains, which I totally am, but. Um, you know, as long as he's got some sort of genre thing to keep him from going too far off the rails. Yeah. <laughs> great. Get a pun there. Nice. <laughs> like, I, I love it. Dogville, but don't like a lot of his other stuff. Antichrist, those kind of things. But yeah, the first, I don't, I haven't seen the third season of E. Giles. No, I haven't seen the third one. Uh, but yeah. uh, the first two were, yeah, uh, very uh, atmospheric, but, you know, they they moved in a story. There there was a through line to what was uh, happening there, which um, right. I guess uh, unadventurous type that I am, I really enjoy when eccentric directors actually bother with narrative through lines. Yeah. And so I think they I think it draws out as what I think is the best in them because they have an anchor for their own uh, diversions. I agree, and it's sort of like what sort of the difference between season one of Twin Peaks and season two 
or season three, it's like suddenly, you know, he doesn't have the the string holding him back to the earth um, that he did in the beginning when he was trying to get it over, get it over the uh, the hurdle of public yeah. claim. And just like you need, you need somebody to keep you in line. Like what was it Mark Frost is collaborating? Oh uh, yeah, Frost was key. But uh, yeah, I've, I've actually seen the American version of uh, Kingdom as well. Uh -huh. I can't remember. Yeah, Stephen King was an executive producer, and um, it um, was actually not that bad. Uh -huh. um, but uh, again, also not nearly as interesting as the foreign original um but uh so it was actually what having seen that then learning oh this is based on something else is what uh, pulled me to uh lars von trier's original series which there were only two seasons at the time yeah i mean i think you're allowed to remake this since it's drawing heavily from twin peaks you know what i mean it's like everybody everybody's inspired by everybody else that's okay yeah, yeah, it's one thing I, I try to make a point when I can about remakes, reboots, redos, is that when you do that, you're not erasing the source material. Yeah, exactly. And like I had with this, it can even bring more people to the original material. So it's, you know, right. I, whenever everyone's down, it's like, oh, they're doing this again. It's like, well, they've okay. always done that. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, yeah, this is. Oh. I was just going to point out that a lot of people have not seen the third episode yet because, or the third series yet, because it was. Yeah. In America, it was only on Mubi, so you had to have Mubi to uh -huh. be able to see it. Now it's on Blu-ray, so more people can see it if they're interested without a Mubi subscription. Um, and might be how I end up finally seeing it, but we shall see. Uh, we are running out of time. We have just a minute left. Um, of what we discussed, any anything uh, anybody's really excited about um, picking up, maybe or? I mean, I'm excited for the kingdom. I'm just waiting for him while I'm in the right mood to sink into something that intense. You know what I mean? Yeah, the yeah kingdom is a yeah. I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, I got to see that this was happening. So, yeah, kingdom, I guess, is uh, the most uh, exciting thing yeah. for me as well. Although uh, the fact that they went so full on for our goodbye uncle tom is nothing short of impressive <laughs> one way or another yeah misguided but impressive <laughs> and, and i'm I looking said, forward to the nostalgia sorry the nostalgia 4k version too and i'm gonna say watch the nude vampire and <laughs> that's gonna be it for tonight thank you for uh joining us eric uh of course hey, check thank out academic lots of writing about film archetypes there and uh, we'll okay. be back next week uh, with uh, director Richard, Richard Bergen.